configuration, the change of figures. First off, why these three? Why didn't he invite me or you or a hundred people? I guess Jesus himself would know that. Bible scholars say probably James because he was going to be the first martyr among the apostles. John, because on the cross, Jesus gives John the task of caring for his mother, Mary. And Peter, who becomes the head of the apostles, that these three people were going to be asked for more than most people were being asked. And so the Jesus in his generosity was giving them this experience so they would have the courage and the strength to get through some difficult times. So that's what it meant to them. Strengthen them. What's it mean to us today? Well, one of the uh, great gifts of my life and several of us was the gift of uh, a Christian musician named Rich Mullins. Some of you were there uh, when Rich would grace our church. Sometimes he would just be at the teen mass. I wouldn't even know this incredible musician was there. To this day, I'll, I'll never forget the first time Rich was there in concert. He was incredible. And at the end of it, everybody, he was singing, oh God, you are my God. And at the end of it, he just indicated everybody to keep singing. So this whole crowd is singing, oh God, you are my God, and he walked off. And at the end of it, everybody's singing and cheering, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, Rich Mullins. He was gone. I said, Rich, where are you? He was gone. Later that night, I caught up with him in the rectory. I said, where'd you go? He said, I, I couldn't stay for all those applause. So what do you mean? He said, my fear is when people are applauding like that, is I'm going to believe them. And my ego will get out of check. 1988, Rich wrote one of the most popular Christian songs. You know what song it was? God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. For many years, that was the most popular Christian song that was sung or listened to. Now it's been replaced by I Can Only Imagine and You Say. But for many years, well over a decade, that was the most popular Christian song. And I remember when Rich first wrote that and we first sang that at the church, we, it was like this big revelation using the term awesome for God. You remember that? I, I had somebody, you know, so excited, they came in one morning getting ready for church, and they handed me a bumper sticker that said, God is awesome. <laughs> and we put it up in the, in the room there, and there were, where you would get vested. And, you know, God is awesome. Our God is an awesome God. What a, what a concept, huh? But Rich wasn't the first one who said that. You know, Job said it. Can you imagine Job? I mean, Job you would not think would be God's biggest fan at times, you know, after everything Job went through. But Job says that dominion and awe belong to our God. So what's this reading mean to us? To me, what this reading is, this reading is a teaching about worship. 
It's a teaching about worship. It's a teaching about God being made known and how we should respond to God being made known in worship. Now, I am absolutely convinced that we as a congregation, you know, we, we do fairly well with our worship. We have good music, great music. We participate fairly well. But I really don't think we get what worship is. And this church still see coming to church as a spectator sport. We come and we watch and we watch people who sing and have a beautiful voice. You know, I mean, you know, when McKaylee sang, how could you not just sit and say, wow, what a beautiful voice and, and that. But that's, that's not what we're called to do. We're not just called to sit here and say, boy, how, how great is that music or how good that is or boy, is that, uh, you know, what a pretty church, what a this and that. We are called not to be a spectator any more than, you know, these three apostles could just sit back and be a spectator and not be changed by what happened. You know, when you come to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, it changes everything. You know, and when I talk about knowledge, you know, people can know up here. You can, you can know up here, oh yeah, Jesus is God, yeah. Oh yeah, they say that at church all the time, Jesus is the Son of God. But when that sinks in to down here, it changes everything. You know, I, I, there's some people, you know, I, there's some people here who, you know, they're criers. And, you know, their laundry comes back and they cry. Oh my gosh, my sweaters are back, you know. And I know that there's some people here who haven't cried in, in 30 years. But sometimes, I, during a song, I, I just get so teary. Sometimes during a reading. Sometimes during prayer, I, I, I say to myself, how can you not just be awestruck with God? How can you not be awestruck with this God who was transfigured before their eyes and who's transfigured every Sunday when we gather? This Jesus comes to life right here. And, and our, our prayer, brothers and sisters, should be of that that depth. You, you know, I love this little book by Matt Redman called Face Down. It's several years old, but listen to what he says. That word awesome is one of the most misused words in our culture. These days, anything vaguely exciting is described as awesome. Everything from the special effects in the latest blockbuster movie to the taste of a hamburger is apparently awesome, or quite literally, worthy of awe. I was at a restaurant recently in the waitress said, would you like anything to drink? And I said, you know, just water with lemon. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we hear fans tell their celebrity heroes, I'm in awe of you. But this can't be the case either. For if these fans were truly in awe, they would be flat on their faces. The Bible tells us that awe is something that is reserved for God alone. Dominion and awe belong to God, Job says, Job 25, 2. And we know that honor, praise, and glory, and power belong to him. Yet we learn that awe, too, must be reserved for God alone. So brothers and sisters, I really believe that God intends every Sunday morning when we show up here that this should be a transfiguration experience. That every Sunday morning that when the word of God is broken open, Jesus should come alive for us. 
that every time we sing these songs that Jesus should come alive for us. And, and our response to the presence of Jesus should be much like James and John and Peter and, and should be, oh my God, how privileged we are to know who Jesus is. How privileged we are to be able to say that we have faith. You know, my best friend in high school, um, I, I loved the guy. We were very close. Uh, he was a year older than me, but every night we were out playing, throwing football back and forth and, and talking in the middle of the street. When I went off to the seminary, his mother died. And when I came home, this guy was, he was like a male model. He was, handsome, perfectly fit, had no faith. And here I was, a homely seminarian. <laughs> and I always envied this guy. You know what he said to me? He said, I lay in bed and cried because I had no faith. And all I can do is see my mother decaying in a casket. And have your faith. Wow. And I was jealous of him. I mean, how privileged we are to come here on Sunday morning and see the glory of God. And yet, you know, There'll be somebody who, who, who thinks, you know, that the breakfast that they have, they're not going to be late for, so they sneak out the door so they don't have to hear that last song. I, could you imagine Peter saying, guys, don't tell them. I've got a golf game. i, I got to get out of here. <laughs> this, this is our mount. This is a transfiguration. Worship is our way of participating in that. And I think the more we realize that, the more we engage in that, the more we let ourselves go and, and be changed by it, the better our church is going to be, the better we're going to be. Listen to this. It's my last comment. Hopefully not last one ever, but <laughs> at least the last one for this minute. Worship is not our gift to God. It is our gift, it is God's gift to us. Worship is not our gift to God, it's God's gift to us. The very fact that we could worship him and know him is God's gift to us. And so may God let us go on that mountain with him. Most of you didn't have to walk 13 miles to get here. I live over on Camelback Mountain, so I know it'd be a long walk. I wind just driving over. <laughs> but what a privilege that God would be transformed before our eyes every Sunday. Wow. We're not that far off of Peter, James, and John. Amen. Amen. Amen.